DARPA has been responsible for some of the most amazing innovations over the last 60 plus years. From the internet, to stealth technology, to GPS, DARPA's goal of creating technological surprise has been realized numerous times. In many instances, DARPA was not just responsible for introducing new technology with substantially increased performance levels, but delivering that technology in a package size that was never before thought possible. In the late 1980s to early 1990s, chip design had reached levels of large-scale integration that made it possible to achieve performance and capabilities on a single chip in what previously took a room-sized collection of multiple devices. For the first time, we started hearing the phrase system on a chip, or SOC. DARPA realized that it would need to create an office that was dedicated to developing the next generation systems on a chip. So in 1991, Dr. Arthi Prabhakar started what would become the Microsystems Technology Office, MTO. In 1991, when we started what was then the Microelectronics Technology Office, that was part of a continuing process at DARPA that is always about this question of what should we be investing in today that can change national security opportunities and outcomes. If you think back to 30 years ago, the commercial semiconductor industry was grappling with the global shifts in production that were going on. They had huge implications for the Defense Department. It was a time when within DARPA, we had been funding work in optoelectronics, in IR detection, um, in all different areas of semiconductor process technology. We had a bunch of new programs that had just come over from the Pentagon that were uh, much more manufacturing oriented. And in, just in the few years before um, we formed um, these, the, the, we did this reorg that included MTO, um, we, we'd had about 30 million of micro or electronics and related funding uh, and it had grown, I think, to about 600 million in just a very few short years. Throughout the next 30 years of MTO's existence, the specific thrust areas of the office have changed based on scientific breakthroughs, commercial advancements, and the specific needs of the warfighter at the time. But common themes quickly emerged. MTO invests in core technology, core component technology, so that means microelectronics, photonics, lasers, light emitting diodes, uh, microelectrical mechanical systems, and really bring all those together in new architectures and exploiting breakthroughs in mathematics and new algorithms. And it's really in bringing all those uh, technologies together is what we think of when we say a microsystem to deliver a new capability in a smaller form factor at lower power um, with new performance that you can't achieve in other ways. That was John from almost 15 years ago during my first time at DARPA. The thrust areas of electronics, photonics, and MEMS continue to be drivers for the office today. MTO's primary focus has been in the world of electronics, whether it was increasing the chip scale power levels through wide band gap materials like gallium arsenide and gallium nitride, developing multi-beam radar arrays at rapid time scales, or integrating chip designs into the third dimension. Electronics advancement has been the bread and butter of the office. So I came to DARPA and to MTO to make a big difference in the field of microelectronics and semiconductors. That's so I worked on silicon, on advanced silicon technologies, and, and one of the things I'm very proud of is the, uh, the transistor that is the core of modern semiconductor technology. It's called a FinFET. That, that was actually produced first in the DARPA program that uh, that I managed when I first got here. Uh, so that was done uh, back in the late 90s and, and now 20 years later, it's what, uh, what, what is inside of every semiconductor uh, device. But if you were gonna say, what's the big game-changing program that somebody could point to in the future that you know, DARPA had a huge impact on, it would be the um, wideband gap program, the silicon carbide effort. The material silicon carbide is much better for high power electronic systems than silicon. 
has a lot it has a lot of better a lot of good properties in fact tesla uses Tesla uses silicon carbide in his systems, and all of the other car manufacturers, as they're going to electric, are going to use it the same. Um, so, so you can see there's a big market coming on board. In fact, it's estimated it's going to be about a $15 billion uh, market, which is huge. Now, as, as silicon carbide gets uh, invested in for these lower power levels, uh, they will become much more invested for high power electronics on ships. Uh, better, better power conversion, more efficient, and what that really means is that you can the swap or the size, weight, and power uh, shrinks by like 80 percent. With large-scale integration and the ever-increasing number of transistors in extremely small spaces, chip design itself became a hurdle to overcome. Advancements in photonics and particularly laser technologies allowed us to print the minuscule feature sizes needed to fit millions and eventually billions of transistors on a single chip. Other photonic and imaging technologies allowed us to pass more data from one point to another faster, and also to see in conditions where no one could see before. Lasers have been around for a long time, and one could think that everything worth knowing is known, but, but it just isn't true. Uh, we don't know very fundamental things about lasers. We don't know how, how to scale up lasers to, to very high power, for example, uh, something of interest to, to the Defense Department. Uh, we also don't know how to scale lasers down to very low power, uh, something of interest if we would want to have a closer coupling between uh, lasers and, and electronics. Photonics was a part of MTO always, but it was not a big part, but at 2001, starting in 2001, there were a few new hires in photonics. And if you look at the photonics budget from 2001 to 2005, 2006, there was a substantial rise in the photonics budget. And in 2002, 2003, I began to realize that photonics on silicon uh, uh, integrating photonics on silicon CMOS compatible way is the right way to go and it's really going to be a game changer in some sense. The impact on the commercial and the DOD world is huge because basically what it does is it, it brings photonics on a chip. So before, photonics used to do lots of different things, but there were all different components. There was laser, there was the modulator, and they were all connected by little pieces of fiber or whatever have you. Now what this has enabled us to do is to combine all the functionalities of photonics on a single chip in a very small form factor. My particular technology can be described broadly as imaging sensors and, and that would cover the range of imaging from all the way into from the um, low light level visible um, all the way out into the long wavelength infrared so it's developing a sensor chip technology that has application in military systems and its imaging sensor technology would include signal processing that's incorporated as part of the chip because we do have programs that involve integrating other functions onto the imaging chip those being one of those being a capability to detect in multiple spectral bands, tune the array to detect in these bands, and also including three-dimensional processing as part of the chip. I'm proud of all my programs, but if you ask me one, I will say it's the LCTI, because the LCTI, which stands for Low Cost Thermal Imager, hyphen M stands for manufacturing. Uh, when I came, the thermal imaging technology of course, is one of the workhorse for the Army. Um, and they were very expensive. Uh, there were many reasons for why they were expensive. What we did is we borrowed some ideas from cell phone camera manufacturing technology and inherited that idea into microbolometer technology. What we did is we built uh, wafer scale cameras just like cell phone cameras, but in long wave, in thermal uh, region. 
uh, and reduce the size, weight, power, and cost. Cost went down to uh, below $500 from $14,000, $15,000. In the mid-1990s, MTO started working in the field of microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS. Before the advent of MEMS, accelerometers and actuators that are now found in every mobile devices were not possible. These are now a part of the mobile device revolution, but it was the early work of MTO that led us to where we are today. So MEMS technology is, is a technology that really is miniaturizing things, but trying to miniaturize in order to get performance benefits, size, obvious size benefits, etc. So MEMS is a technology that could say take take a capability that only sits on a desktop or on a table or in a room on a base or something or on a plane or a truck and put it right in the hands of a soldier. Uh, so things like chip scale atomic clock, which was one of the programs that I had run, uh, <clears throat> that was uh, something that allowed soldiers to get a, a, an accuracy and stability and timing that suddenly gave them capabilities they didn't have before. For example, GPS became much more accurate. Uh, the ability to jam their GPS and their communications became much more difficult uh, because you know you have this amount of uh, accuracy and precision and stability in the timing that you have there. The Hermit stands for Harsh Environment Micromechanical Technology. I may not even remember exactly what, what that stood for there. But it was a program that, was, that recognized that for MEMS devices, packaging was very important, that you had to protect them from the environment or if they couldn't be protected, you had to figure out a way to, to allow them to operate in those environments with the performance, the advertised performance. And I think that um, in the end, that program, it, it, it brought about some of the packaging technologies that were necessary to make uh, MEMS timing uh, really where it is right now. And even before I came, you know, CSAC was a program occurring that really led to a kind of a new idea in MEMS, not just single devices, but entire microsystems, in which we miniaturize not just mechanical moving parts, but optical parts like micro lasers, how to control their temperature profile, how to package them, and have MEMS, high frequency resonators and devices, and optical devices. MTO has also had a history of being heavily involved in biotechnology. It was a combination of efforts from both MTO and DSO, the Defense Sciences Office, that eventually formed the Biological Technologies Office, or BTO, DARPA. MTO's bio portfolio is still having a huge impact, particularly right now. The DLT, uh, it, the goal of that is to create a manned portable device that uh, cleans the blood of pathogens and toxins. Uh, the pathogens uh, is a broad range of pathogens that are cleared by the 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 ligands that we created in the device, the system that we created. Uh, one of the pathogens that's uh, effectively cleared was COVID, a uh, 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 19 pandemic related SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so uh, with patients that are very sick or septic, you know, they're on, you know, uh, uh, so critically ill, they're in the ICU on a ventilator, uh, having a dialysis machine to help uh, support uh, their kidneys, uh, they they had some of these patients. They put them on uh, the DLT device. It helps support their kidneys, sort of clean out the inflammation and remove uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the patients got better. Sepsis is a huge problem. Bacterial sepsis kills uh, you know more than 200,000 Americans a year. Uh, you know, and we're going through the COVID-19 pandemic now. So anything that we can do to support people uh, to get them through this uh, uh, pandemic or through uh, an infection that's related to that or uh, injury. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, part of the reason why I came to DARPA. Over the years, MTO and DARPA have developed some fantastic technologies, but all of this is only possible because of its people. I think the largest technical challenge in my field at DARPA and in almost any field at DARPA, is the sociology problem. What you're trying to do is uh, create a new research community, a new way of doing business. Uh, you're not here to work in your specialty or work in your traditional mode of getting things done. Uh, you're here to change the way people interact, make people interact who don't traditionally interact. This is a huge sociology problem and one that we, uh, we work day and night. The program managers 
uh, who were around me. And we were a very uh, collegial group in some sense. Uh, I started some seminars and did discussion groups within the program managers and so on. But I would, I would at any time, I, would, I could drop into anybody's office and they would welcome me and, and I would ask them questions and they are happy to respond to me and share their ideas with me and so on. There was no rivalry, there was camaraderie. Uh, and that, that, was, that was really, really great. You know, people will come to my office, they want me to sell a program, and they'll tell me everything. And so what better way to learn about all these different areas uh, that you could start programs in? And that was the wonderful experience. I would sit in my office, people would visit me, they would tell me everything, all the details that I would not have been able to find out by doing a web search or talking to them at a conference and that sort. On top of that, I could hold workshops, bringing all the experts together in the field. I mean, what other opportunity do you have to bring all the experts together in a certain field and learn what they know, listen to their justifications for going in certain directions? And you know, the learning experience was just fantastic, just, just from the technical side, from the government side and how funding works and people that you get to know, the networking at DARPA, also fantastic, right? This is, it's a, it's a small community, but you get to know some just awesome people across the board. As we look back on the last 30 years of MTO and all the amazing technical accomplishments we've achieved, we should ask, where are we going from here? We find ourselves at another inflection point. We're at the start of the fourth wave of microelectronics. What will MTO develop in the next 30 years? Electronics for extreme environments? manufacturing of complex 3D microsystems, photonics for passing the ever-increasing amount of data delivered by sensors, precision MEMS for alternatives to GPS? I think a time has come when asking the question, how can we develop new technologies that can help artificial intelligence perform better? I think that's an important question to ask. And maybe that's the direction, but MTO will go. But the best thing that MTO can do is to hire, uh, hire good people who think of uh, disruptive ideas and who are not afraid to take risks. They are the ones who are going to come up with what are the game-changing ideas and what are, the, what are the new things to work on in the next 30 years? I look forward to where MTO is going because I think, uh, you know, the people that are coming in there, the, the new program managers uh, are experts in their field and they have a real handle on where the future is heading. Some of those things, maybe we don't recognize it now, but I'd be willing to bet that those things are going to be very, very important in the future. And I think they'll be very important for advancing uh, the ability of our defense systems to to uh, uh, be ready for whatever may happen in the future. You always need this blend of things that just are staggeringly new and exciting and no one's ever thought about before, but also all the ways to make them real and practical and to show people not just that it's cool and sexy in a lab, but how it changes outcomes for them, because ultimately it's going to be that adoption that changes, you know, that achieves DARPA's mission. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy, happy, happy birthday, MTO. <laughs> happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. Happy birthday, MTO. I'm looking forward to everything that will come from this office over the next 30 years. <laughs>
So before we get started, if we take a step back, we are reminded that we are in an era of global technology uh, competition. And this certainly includes microelectronics. It is because of this that the DOD named microelectronics a priority and the US government included new microelectronics initiatives in the FY21 National Defense Authorization Act. And it certainly underpins the capabilities that will, will be essential to the future battle space. So this is really important because these investments will strengthen our semiconductor technology leadership position and ensure new mission uh, capabilities. And as we all know, DARPA has a long history of successfully addressing challenges in the microelectronics field to benefit national security and the commercial sector. So with that as a backdrop, there are three things I would like to highlight. First is a high level view of missions and the role of microelectronics. Second is a look at some of the microelectronics challenges that we face as an industry. And third, we will look at the microelectronics needs from research to development and design to manufacturing to ensure a robust and resilient pipeline of innovation. So let's review at a high level defense mission trends. This will help provide the context for the role of microelectronics in our defense systems. And why more than ever, a strong domestic microelectronics industrial base is so critical to national security. So today's challenges to national security just aren't changing. They're actually accelerating faster than ever before. Our adversaries are highly adaptive and confronting us from every domain across air, sea, space, land, and cyber. And these threats are directly related to the speed of technology development and deployment by our adversaries. So to counter this, joint all domain operations is providing a complete picture of the battle space and empowering warfighters to quickly make decisions that drive action. This is evolving warfighting by synchronizing major weapon systems and crucial data sources. It allows commanders to quickly predict adversaries' next moves and disrupt and overwhelm them. This next generation battle space requires solutions that speed joint decision-making in a range of contested environments. Some of these mission areas include advanced capabilities for ISR mission in uh, decision-making to accelerate the observe, orient, decide, and act or OODA loop. Assisting decision-makers by leveraging advanced AI to process the information being collected and shared and seamlessly connecting platforms and systems through advanced communications to share this information. Think about more interconnected systems and leveraging commercial technology. So it's really about coordinated, distributed in real-time decisions and actions to achieve dominance across the entire battle space. But the aircraft, the satellites, the ships, and the ground vehicles our forces operate today collect an abundance of information and processing, analyzing, and sharing that amount of data is a challenge, especially when you factor in multiple levels of security at which those systems operate. So as we just reviewed, uh, joint all domain operations is based on the ability to seamlessly collect, analyze, and share information across operational areas when and where needed. So this ability will continue to rely on advancements in sensor platforms, in processing and comms. And these will continue to rely on advanced microelectronics. Looking at sensors, radar and EOIR sensor systems provide advanced precision targeting, navigation, threat detection, and next generation ISR capabilities for every armed service and operational environment. Space-based solutions collect and transmit imagery and sensor data that informs critical decisions made by troops on the battlefield. These electronics will continue to drive advancements in analog and mixed signal for front ends. And by leveraging real-time AI, intelligent edge computing will provide the ability to rapidly analyze high volumes of sensor data in real time and make decisions where the information is gathered. This will rely on advancements in new accelerators and novel architectures for the next generation of AI. 5G and beyond comms is the connector 
that enable shared knowledge, it will seamlessly connect all assets in the joint battle space and enable decisive action through low latency and high bandwidths, sharing data from land, air, sea, cyber, and space. This will facilitate giving the warfighter AI-powered insights from devices at the edge to predict, disrupt, and disable emerging global threats. And we will continue to leverage commercial advancements. So we reviewed at a high level defense mission needs to help provide the context for the role of microelectronics in our defense systems. Then we talked about the enabling capabilities in sensor electronics, edge intelligence, and advanced comms. Now let's take a look at some of the microelectronics challenges that we face as an industry. So more than ever, a strong domestic microelectronics industrial base is critical to both economic and national security. But there are economic, technical, and geo geopolitical trends in the industry that are challenging for both the commercial and defense sectors. And the defense industrial base has unique microelectronics challenges that the commercial sector does not necessarily have. The two sectors have very different business models. The commercial sector is market-driven with a large demand driven by products that are ultimately purchased by consumers, including laptops, tablets, and smartphones. The defense sector is very mission-driven providing national security with systems and platforms operating in harsh environments in every domain, air, sea, space, land, and cyber. This leads to unique challenges and concerns about the availability, the performance, the trustworthiness, and the affordability of the microelectronics our defense systems rely on. So let's spend a few minutes reviewing some of these challenges. The first challenge is availability and access. Unlike commercial products with short life cycles, defense system life cycles are decades long, requiring assured access to microelectronics for many, many years in both state-of-the-art and older technology nodes. In addition, the defense industry currently does not have access to state-of-the-art onshore trusted foundries and advanced packaging assembly and test and it struggles to get access to heterogeneous integration technologies, including bear dye and chiplets, to integrate the latest commercial innovations with unique defense microelectronics. In addition, we operate in harsh environments and we have other unique requirements, which drives the need for assured access to technologies that include radiation hardened microelectronics for satellite and space operations, high temperature electronics for extreme harsh environments, and compound semiconductors for high performance sensor and power systems. And of course, we need access to the workforce of the future with specialized skills and the ability to work in secure environments. And then there is supply chain vulnerability. The pandemic highlighted the importance of semiconductors and supply chain vulnerabilities. The industry has been undergoing a shortage due to multiple factors, including shifts in global demand and events that disrupted manufacturing centers. And then there are the geopolitical concerns. This is certainly being addressed. There are efforts underway to strengthen the domestic semiconductor industry, and this includes supply chain security. And studies have documented just how complex the global semiconductor supply chain is and the need for well-informed policy to address the issues. So we will, so this will continue to be a challenge. Let's look at some of the performance challenges. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, rapidly processing and sharing an abundance of information across multiple domains to enable real-time decisions and actions will continue to rely on leaps in performance, but in swap C constrained environments. So energy efficiency will be a key driver of future microelectronics innovations to address limitations in sensor processing throughput and data transport bandwidths. Think about advancements to enable orders of magnitude improvement. And we cannot rely on geometric scaling and new materials and devices alone to achieve the performance gains that we've realized in the past. In the future, we also need design innovation. Think about new architectures, new accelerators, novel approaches for the next generation of AI systems. And think about how we design, how we use co-design to optimize solutions across the entire technology stack 
and how to better leverage AI ML in the design process. These will be critical. And equally important is discovering new ways of thermal management in these constrained thermally harsh environments. So reliable thermal management technology is an area of great interest and opportunity. So next is the trust and security challenge. The trust issue is significant with worldwide supply chains. How do we trust that our electronics do only what they were designed to do? This applies to the commercial microelectronics we use as well as unique defense components. And there are the multiple levels of security at which our systems must operate under to protect the information and technology in our defense systems. So supply chain vulnerability remains a top concern, which was really highlighted this past year, as we mentioned earlier. And there was a combination of technical and policy actions addressing this. One of these actions is the development of new microelectronic security standards for custom ICs and COTS, and this includes implementing zero trust concepts. This remains an area of intense interest and opportunity, not just for the defense industry, but also for the commercial sector for new and innovative ways to address trust and security across the entire technology stack and life cycle. And these, and these efforts uh, will be ongoing as the threats evolve. And then there is affordability. The high cost and complexity of microelectronics design, prototyping and manufacturing has been well-documented and driving new ways to dramatically reduce design cycle time and the cost of microelectronics but we need orders of magnitude improvement. And as the industry leverages heterogeneous integration to enable microsystems design, there's an opportunity to address the affordability challenge associated with chip package co-design. This includes microsystems co-design methodologies and tools that rapidly and efficiently and affordably integrate simulation tools into the design environment to address the challenges of chip package interconnect design. This includes tools for the simultaneous thermal, electrical, thermal mechanical, and reliability analysis for complex 2D, 2.5D, and 3D heterogeneous integration technologies. And then there is the staggering cost to prototype and manufacture. This not only challenges traditional players in the market, but it also impedes the entry and success of startups. And finally, we must affordably accelerate the validation and fielding of new capabilities based on future advancements in microelectronics. So we looked at the challenges. Let's take a look at the needs and opportunities across the TRL spectrum. Looking at research, the Decadal Plan for Semiconductors provides a very good outline for semiconductor research priorities across the entire technology stack. It addresses challenges in sensing, energy efficient processing, memory and storage, communications, and security. This applications-driven holistic approach is guiding future pathfinding research strategies and guiding policymakers who understand the need to invest in the future. And there continues to be a strong need for ecosystems that provide affordable early access to the new technologies that come from research to accelerate technology transfer, prototyping, and product development innovation especially for small enterprises that don't have the resources that the large companies have. The FY21 NDAA includes establishing a national semiconductor technology center to focus on this need. And finally, rebuilding the domestic state-of-the-art CMOS manufacturing base is certainly a priority, but we must also ensure that we maintain a robust and affordable manufacturing capability for other mission critical semiconductor technologies for harsh environments and for RF and EO IR sensor systems. And this includes the legacy technologies and support for low volume high mix. So looking ahead, developing long-term strategies and roadmaps that prioritize needs and gaps and investments across the microelectronics life cycle will be a critical next step. This will strengthen US semiconductor technology leadership which is critical for the defense sector. So let's finish up by circling back to what is driving the need to accelerate future innovations in microelectronics. 
We are all committed to helping the Department of Defense and its allies realize their vision for future battle space operations by putting the best capabilities into our warfighters' hands with reliability and speed. By leveraging data as a weapon, our warfighters will continue to be empowered to make decisions that drive action, disrupting and overwhelming adversaries in a matter of seconds versus minutes where seconds really matter. It's about making the right decisions and making them faster. Thank you for your time today. Next, we will hear from DARPA MTO Program Manager, Dr. David Abe. Hello, I'm Dave Abe, and I'm a Program Manager in the DARPA Microsystems Technology Office. I have a wide-ranging portfolio at MTO that includes programs in electronic materials, directed energy, charged particle beams and high-power microwaves in particular, computational electromagnetics, radiation-hardened electronics, acoustoelectric devices, and microwave and millimeter wave power amplifiers. But today I'd like to talk about magnetic materials and the challenges and opportunities for monolithic microwave and millimeter wave IC integration to create new capabilities for advanced communications and radar systems. Magnetic materials and components play a critical role in the technology we use in our daily lives. The functionality of these components and devices relies on the unique properties of the magnetic materials, many of which are not readily replicated by electric field-based devices. This is because an electric analog to many magnetic phenomena doesn't exist. But before diving into RF signal processing, I'd like to give a more commonly observed example of a recent application where magnetics and magnetic materials have made a significant impact. The figure on the left is a permanent magnet synchronous reluctance motor that you probably see in action every day if you're on the road. This type of motor is used in electric vehicles such as the Toyota Prius and late model Teslas. In these cars, a permanent magnet-based solution has replaced the rotor in the older induction motor technology, and this has resulted in higher torque from a standing start, increased motor and drivetrain efficiencies, and extended driving range. But this performance increase was made possible by advances in magnetic materials. The graph on the right plots the magnetic energy product of different magnetic materials in kilojoules per cubic meter by year. Before 1960, there were modest increases in the performance of ferrites, but it really took the introduction of rare earth alloys with their high magnetic anisotropy and high magnetic moments to revolutionize permanent magnet performance and to enable highly compact implementations. And so, we find the highest energy product neodymium iron boron magnets powering our electric vehicles today. I just gave you a macroscopic example, but advances, can advances in magnetic material performance also bring significant benefits to smaller scale microwave and millimeter wave devices? And the answer is, of course, yes. As an example, consider the transmit receive or TR module as shown in the lower left. As the name implies, the TR module both sends and receives RF signals, and it's the basic building block of modern RF phased array systems. It contains both monolithic microwave integrated circuits, MIMICs, and CMOS integrated circuits to provide advanced functionality. Magnetics play a critical role in the circulator, outlined by the yellow box. The circulator sits between the antenna element and the transmit and receive sections, and it provides isolation between the ports, a good RF match to the antenna, and enables simultaneous transmit and receive capabilities. The magnetic material is the large round hockey puck that can be seen in the center of the box. There are several things to note. The circulator requires a bulky external magnet, that's that hockey puck. It takes up a significant fraction of the total module volume and weight. And also the circulator is not an integrated component, and it requires additional elements to match it to the mimic all of which add loss, reduce bandwidth, and increase cost and complexity. And finally, as we try to scale the millimeter wave frequencies, the circulator isn't able to meet phased array form factor requirements. Active electronically scanned arrays, or AESAs, use multiple radiating elements driven by TR modules to form the steerable beam. On the left, the checkerboard is a schematic representation of the phased array surface, 
where for optimal performance, the spacing between elements must be a half wavelength or less. As we increase the frequency, wavelength inversely decreases. And for example, at 3 gigahertz, the half wavelength spacing is 50 millimeters, but at 30 gigahertz, it's only 5 millimeters. The TR modules sit behind each radiating element, and they have to shrink as the frequency increases. However, the external magnet used in current circulators does not scale proportionally with the wavelength, and it's incompatible in the form factors and spacings needed at millimeter wave frequencies. So what's needed are miniaturized integrated magnetics that can scale along with the rest of the TR module in our push to higher frequencies. And to achieve this, we need to eliminate the bulky external biasing magnet and replace it with an integrable, semiconductor process compatible, self-biased magnetic material. The DARPA Magnetic Miniaturized and Monolithically Integrated Components, or M-Cubic program, was created to drive the integration of advanced magnetic components to reduce size and to enable new functionalities for both microwave and millimeter wave electronics. The M-Cubic program is addressing three primary challenges. Not surprisingly, it begins with new material development, particularly self-biased magnetic materials that are also compatible with standard semiconductor processing and capable of monolithic integration. Modeling is another key component of the M-Cubic program, where the goal is to develop tools for a priori design of magnetic components and to support their integration and optimization with other IC electronics. And then the final leg is exploitation, where we can take advantage of these new monolithically integrated magnetic materials to demonstrate new device functionality and performance. A key success of the M-Cubic program has been the development of a thick hexafarite material that possesses su sufficiently high self-biased magnetic fields and is compatible with millimeter wave form factors. Thickness is an important metric as the magnetic field strength is proportional to the volume of the material. An SEM image of the hexafarite material is shown on the left. Significant challenges were overcome to produce the right polycrystalline structure and the 100 micron plus thicknesses, all of which are compatible with mimic fabrication and design processes. The drawing on the right depicts an integrated Ka band circulator that uses a 1.5 millimeter diameter disk of the self biased material, which is now compatible with Ka band phased array spacing. This graph compares the volumes of conventional Ka band externally biased circulators with the new self-biased devices. The upper photo gives you an idea of the size of the external magnet used in the conventional devices. The green triangles in the lower right of the plot show the volumes of the integrated self-biased circulators, one of which can barely be seen in the lower photo sitting on the nib of a fountain pen. The new self-biased circulators have excellent bandwidth performance and despite the small size, over one watt power handling capability. In the photo, the mimic outlined in yellow and sitting on a dime to provide scale demonstrates full integration of the self-biased hexafarite circulator in the Ka band TR module. For comparison, a connectorized Ka band isolator is shown on the left. And in this expanded photo, you can see the circulator, that's the circle on the hexagonal plate, integrated with the gallium arsenide TR circuit. The module demonstrated 20 to 40 gigahertz performance with a saturated power of over 125 milliwatts at 36 gigahertz. And the five millimeter by two millimeter size is compatible with the requirements for the phased array. The new technology doesn't stop at 40 gigahertz, but it's scalable to frequencies as high as W band in the 75 to 110 gigahertz range. The photo on the left is a state-of-the-art waveguide isolator in W-band. To the right and to scale is a self-biased hexafarite isolator integrated with a W-band amplifier. The whole package weighs about 1 1,000th of a gram, and the 1.2 millimeter by 1.1 millimeter form factor is compatible with the half-wavelength spacing at 94 gigahertz. These newly developed self-biased hexafarite materials have opened up a wide range of commercial and defense applications, from arrays for 5G communication to AESA radar systems. And this is far from the end of the story for new magnetic materials and applications. 
This slide highlights just some of the new application spaces and future R&D opportunities for magnetics. Starting at the top left, as wide band gap and now ultra wide band gap RF semiconductors reach higher power and duty performance, there are challenges for magnetic materials and components to keep pace with the thermal and power requirements, as well as to develop design tools to assess their impact on system performance and to support integration and optimization. Moving clockwise, RF devices are also constantly pushing the envelope of frequency and bandwidth performance. For example, tunable low loss magnetic components are desirable for signal processing applications such as filters and frequency selective limiters. And as always, mimic integration and compatibility with existing semiconductor fab processes are key enablers for technology adoption. The implementation of magnetic components on novel surfaces is another theme. Conformal, printable circuits and the amenability to additive manufacturing techniques can enable new architectures to provide enhanced capabilities to wearable electronics and biomedical devices, for example. And last but not least, we come to the venerable transformer. Platforms keep getting smaller, power demands keep increasing, and the size of power systems have to meet the challenging size and weight constraints. Again, new materials could drive a revolution in power density performance where, for example, the development of new magnetic materials for transformers supports higher frequency, lower loss, and higher thermal conductivity performance. These are just a few highlights of new challenges and new opportunities for future research and development in magnetic materials and components. I look forward to engaging with this community in the future, and I thank you very much for your attention. Discussing high power and low noise gallium nitride transistors for millimeter wave applications are DARPA MTO Program Manager, Dr. Tom Kaiser, followed by Dr. Umesh Mishra, Professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Dr. Josie Chang, Engineer at Northrop Grumman. Hi, I'm Tom Kaiser, Program Manager at, in DARPA MTO. And today I want to talk to you about uh, some programs that we're working on to improve the power and noise performance of gallium nitride transistors for millimeter wave applications. But first, I want to tell you why we're interested in this. Transistors are the building blocks for something called microwave, monolithic microwave integrated circuits, are mimics. Uh, and, by, and there's a lot of applications driving the need to move to millimeter wave frequencies. For example, for EW applications, we would like to build high efficiency, wide power, wideband power amplifier mimics. For active denial systems, there's a need to improve the efficiency and the power of mimic amplifiers that operate at W band frequencies. And for receiver applications for communications and sensor systems, we'd like amplifiers with higher linearity, higher efficiency, and wide bandwidth. Uh, all these, the building block, as I said, the building blocks of these is the basic transistor, and we need to improve the performance of the millimeter wave transistors in order to realize these systems. Uh, in order to do that, DARPA is going down a path of the a program called DREAM, or Dynamic Range Enhanced Electronics and Materials, with the overall objective of improving the performance of the microwave, uh, of the millimeter wave transistors. In the plot in the lower right, in the left, uh, we see an example of uh, power as a function of frequency out of, uh, of RF amplifiers. Uh, typically, and you can see at frequencies below 10 uh, gigahertz, the microwave frequencies, we get very high power, but as we push up to higher and higher frequencies, the power dramatically rolls off. What we're doing with the DREAM program is exploring new materials and device designs to push that curve to the right and up with the overall objective of improving the power density or power of these millimeter wave transistors by 5x and the linearity or dynamic range uh, by over 100x. And we're looking at doing this through novel materials and 3D device geometries. An example of what I mean by new materials is in the, uh, the, the chart on the right, where we can go to these materials like scandium aluminum nitride or gallium aluminum nitride, which are compatible with gallium nitride uh, materials to push, the, uh, to push the breakdown voltage so we can operate these devices at higher power uh, and higher, uh, higher voltage and higher power. 
Uh, another example is what can we leverage or learn from the silicon and make 3D type structures to ultimately improve the linearity of uh, these transistors. The overall goal then is to utilize these new materials and device structures to create these high power, high linearity transistors that can be used for uh, millimeter wave applications. So where are we today? Uh, we successfully completed phase one uh, of the program, and the focus was on the millimeter wave frequency at 30 uh, gigahertz. Uh, one of the performers, Northrop Grumman, looked, took a CMOS-inspired approach based on the CMOS FinFET and looked at building gallium nitride FinFET device structures and were able to show a four times higher output power density at 30 gigahertz than the conventional GAN transistor. And Dr. Josie Chang from uh, Northrop Grumman is going to give you a deep dive on uh, that particular project. A team at Raytheon and NRL looked at new materials, and particularly the scanning aluminum nitride and aluminum nitride, to enhance uh, the breakdown voltage and operating voltage, and also the amount of charge or carrier current that can be flown in these devices, to, and again showed a two and a half increase in power at uh, 30 gigahertz. A team at HRL looked at channel engineering, uh, taking the basic gallium nitride hemp and manipulating the properties of the materials in the channel of the device to improve its linearity on dynamic range and improve a linearity figure merit, which is the linearity over the DC power consumption by over 100x. And finally, uh, researchers at the University of California at Santa Barbara uh, developed this nitrogen polar recess uh, hemp type device which also showed a 100x improvement in this linearity figure of merit. In addition, it showed a significant increase in the power density out of these devices as well. And Professor Umes Mishra from UCSB will give a deep dive on this subject. So where are we, where are we going? Uh, it's kind of the overall plan is in phase one, we developed a proof of concept, and I just shared with you the four different uh, highlights of that, which increased power, power density, and linearity of the devices. We are now actively working on phase two and looking at scaling these transistors to even higher frequencies, in particular the W-band frequencies, and at the same time using these transistors to demonstrate uh, MIMICS, or these microwave integrated circuits, uh, for wideband applications and for high power applications at W-band, uh, and for wideband and w -band, V and W-band low noise applications. In the same time, we're looking at uh, partnering with mission, uh, mission insertion uh, partners, uh, to get this technology ready for the warfighter, in, including looking at mimic readiness uh, and reliability and yield assessment so that we can make this technology ready for prime time. Uh, and now I would like to introduce the two, two of my performers who are going to give deep dives uh, on this program, uh, Professor Umes Mishra from the University of uh, Santa Barbara, uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, and Dr. Josie Chang from uh, Northrop Grumman. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, again to the ERI Summit. Uh, I'm Umesh Mishra, the Donald W. Whittier Professor of Electrical Engineering at UC Santa Barbara. I'm very pleased uh, to talk about the high millimeter wave power density that is afforded from nitrogen polar gallium nitride transistors. This is work that we have done at UCSB, and uh, the results are uh, very ex exciting, and I am ex myself very excited to share them with you. What's the biggest advantage of nitrogen polar gallium nitride is the availability of high power density at millimeter wave frequencies. If you take a typical millimeter wave source, it's made up of uh, an array of elements as shown here, and each element produces power and you can actually have power from various elements and by actually uh, arranging the amount of power that is coming out from various elements, you can actually direct the beam or increase the power or both. Uh, at millimeter wave frequencies, the lattice spacing or the spacing between these elements is typically determined by the wavelength and that wavelength at millimeter wave frequencies is small, about one millimeter. So you don't have much room to put in a microwave element to produce the power. Hence, if you want a lot of power from a small area, you need high power density. There are many benefits out of that. You can either get a smaller, lighter array with a lower part count, and this basically would be, if you have lower part count, unfortunately, or 
uh, it also uh, one of the attendant benefits or dis disadvantages depending on how you look at it is that you have limited beam steering but uh, certain applications require uh, reduced or no beam steering. Alternatively, if you, ha you can have the same size array and you have more power per element, then you can get greater range from this array relative to other technologies. There are also long range point sources like backhaul, which are fi relatively fixed. And for those applications, uh, nitrogen polar gallium nitride is extremely beneficial. Here I show the output power density of gallium polar gallium nitride versus nitrogen polar gallium nitride. And you can see that as the frequency increases, the power density from gallium polar GAN decreases, shown by this line, and it actually flattens out at around 2 to 3 watts per millimeter uh, at millimeter wave frequencies. Nitrogen polar GAN performs much better two to three times the power density, 200 to 300% larger power density at 94 gigahertz relative to gallium polar GAN. This is an enormous advantage. So I've talked about gallium polar GAN and nitrogen polar GAN. What is uh, each of this material look like? Uh, what does it look like? Gallium polar GAN, if you look down on the crystal face of gallium polar GAN, just look down on the crystal, what you'll see is just gallium atoms. Nitrogen polar GAN, if you look down on the face of the crystal, you'll see nitrogen atoms. And they are stacked in this hexagonal close back structure, which is typical of the crystal of gallium nitride. So it's literally gal nitrogen polar GAN is gallium, traditional gallium polar GAN flipped on its head. When you do that, you also end up flipping where the two-dimensional electron gas, this is the, these are the electrons that carry current, where these electrons are actually uh, induced. In the gallium polar uh, traditional high electron mobility transistor, aluminum gallium nitride is grown on gallium nitride and the two-dimensional electron gas is set here. When you flip it on the, its head, Gallium nitride is actually grown on top of ALGAN to produce the two-dimensional electron gas. So, it's, so in one case, you have ALGAN on top of GAN. The other case, you have GAN on top of ALGAN. Now you might say, oh, this is very simple. What's the big deal? Unfortunately, life is not so simple. And over the years, what we have developed at UC Santa Barbara is a, is a device called the gallium, nitrogen polar gallium nitride deep recess hemp. This device actually starts on a silicon carbide substrate. Silicon carbide substrate is very thermally conductive, so it reduces the thermal effects on the device. There's an aluminum gallium nitride back barrier. This gallium, aluminum gallium nitride back barrier on which the gallium nitride is grown provides the back barrier for channel confinement. And it also, you have the two-dimensional electron gas uh, induced at the GAN-ALGAN interface. And then you have, uh, we, we have developed regrown N plus, which is highly doped gallium nitride. These regrown regions form the contacts to the two dimensional electron gas. And these contacts are very high quality, i.e. they have very low resistance. And then finally, you have on top of the GAN channel, you have aluminum gallium nitride cap and a gallium nitride cap. These are unique properties of nitrogen polar deep recess hemp. The gallium nitride cap reduces the dispersion, that is dispersion being the difference in the uh, performance between DC and RF uh, of the device, and you don't want that dispersion to be high. In fact, you want it to be zero. Uh, in other words, whatever you see at low frequencies should be available at high frequencies. This gallium nitride cap reduces dispersion and simultaneously because of the physics of polarization increases the conductivity of the channel underneath. So simultaneously you get a very low parasitic resistance in the device and you get low dispersion because of this cap. Also because you have the placement of the, gal the gate very close to the channel, you have very high gain 
both because of the uh, the proximity of the gain to the two of the gate to the two-dimensional electron gas and also the high uh, pro the uh, the exceptional pro transport properties of the two-dimensional electron gas lastly we have an mis gate an insulator under the gate which when coupled with the aluminum gallium nitride cap reduces the gate leakage and gives you very high breakdown so this rather complex structure actually addresses all the frailties of the gallium polar device and therefore we end up with very high performance. What is the kind of performance that we achieve at 94 gigahertz? Silicon nitride passivated deep recess hemps actually end up with an output power density as a function of bias that goes up linearly. This linear relationship of power density with bias shows that the, the device is actually behaving in a near ideal fashion. At 23 volts bias, we get 8.8 .8 watts per millimeter at 23 volts, which a few years ago, ago would have been assumed to be impossible. Simultaneously, power added efficiency is very important. And we can see that even at 8.84 .8 watts per millimeter, the power added efficiency is very good, 27%. And in fact, uh, at 5.3 watts per millimeter, which in itself is two times higher than what is typically ob obtained from gallium polar hems, we get a power added efficiency of 35%. This is exceptionally high performance. Power added efficiency is, a, is an extreme requirement because whatever is not produced as RF output power is dissipated as heat, and that requires you to thermally manage the system, which is typically very expensive. So now that we have good devices, how does this actually reach the marketplace? Because of the university R&D results, which demonstrated that N-Polar GAN was exceptional, uh, the Office of Naval Research has funded Transform to, uh, to develop an epi epitaxial material supply of nitrogen polar hemps. This commercial epi supply allows small businesses and established companies like the DOD primes, for example, to access nitrogen polar GAN moving the technology to its implementation into systems. There are multiple MOCVD platforms uh, which, can, uh, which are available to grow. Uh, they are actually eight inch compatible. So in the future, the material can be grown on eight inch substrates. Uh, there's comprehensive material characterization available and the uh, and transform has demonstrated that instead of growing on university sized materials on four inch silicon carbide they have grown and demonstrated devices with no dispersion remember i said no dispersion is very important for um, making a device work at millimeter waves in fact at any rf uh, frequency so we've gone from university demonstration to availability of material for uh, the user uh, in the marketplace. To conclude, um, I'd like to say that nitrogen polar GAN um, is uh, actually a resurgence for gallium nitride, uh, very apt for this summit. And the reason is that gallium nitride had flattened out in its performance at millimeter waves for many years. Here's the performance of gallium polar GAN as a function of time, and it was all below this three watts per millimeter line. Thanks to nitrogen polar GAN, we have broken out of this, uh, this uh, funk, and we are up at very high frequencies, uh, very high power densities at W band, which is 94 gigahertz. And uh, I'd like to conclude with saying that gallium polar GAN has performed extremely well from, uh, from C band to K band and up to maybe K A band. And its performance uh, is more and more challenged as it goes to higher and higher frequencies. Nitrogen polar GAN, on the other hand, performs well from C band all the way to D band. And so it can serve the full EM spectrum of interest through D band. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you found uh, the talk of interest. All right, thank you very much. I will be talking about super lattice castellated bets or slick bets.
for high power millinative wave applications. My name is Josephine Chang. I'm a senior staff member at Northrop Grumman Mission Systems, and I'll be presenting work done by the team at Northrop that has been working on um, the DREAM program. So Shamima, Brian, Tim, Jordan, Ken, Sam, and Rob. So this session is about working on FETs, transistors, which is what drives at a very basic level uh, our performance for many different applications. One example application that I'd like to start us off with here is wideband radar applications. So in Dream Phase 1 for this application, we worked on FETs with increased power density and increased efficiency. And these FETs then enabled what I'm showing here in uh, Dream Phase 1 as increased active range for an example radar uh, system. In Dream Phase 2, we have been working on um, FETs that have higher frequency performance. And how that translates for this example application would be a array or a sensor that not only can do, say, radar, but can do multiple functions like comms and, um, and, and viewing multiple different targets at the same time. So this high performance wideband reconfigurability, which is what enables this multi-function performance, is what we are currently working towards enabling. So like um, the, the uh, other talk in this session, which is about GAN devices, this is also a gallium nitride-based RF device, slick set, but we, take it, we have another take at improving RF devices. So instead of having just one 2D electron gas of, of uh, material supporting the active area in our channel, we actually have um, a super lattice of 2D electron gases, or 2 DEGs, um, in our slick vet. And this stack of 2D electron gases um, increases the RF power density that the super lattice can support. And this is what ultimately gives us the increased active sensor range in the example, uh, the example application that I just spoke about. What we then do with this stack of um, super lattice two eggs is we create a three-dimensional device by cutting trenches um, into the device, effectively making it look like, say, a FinFET. Um, and then we put a three-dimensional castellated gate up and down and around and over these ridges to uh, enable very strong gate control over the switch that we've effectively created. And this three-dimensional gate um, enables power efficient operation, and it also enables us to reduce the gate length of the device, which is what enables frequency scaling and thus reconfigurability for adaptable multifunction sensors um, in the scenario I just described earlier. So in this, the picture up in the top left, you can see the three-dimensional gate going over these fin-like structures. And we have images shown in the upper middle and upper right um, of the device itself that we fabricated. Here we have some typical characteristics of a slick set device to highlight some of its um, more important attributes. So if you look at the left-hand side plot, if you look at the, the solid line, you can see that the drain current goes up to over 2.5 amps per millimeter. And this is about 4x higher, or at least 2x higher, than uh, comparable state-of-the-art commercially available um, transistors. And this very high drain current is what translates to high output power, ultimately. If you look at the dotted line on the upper left plot, you see a, a straight plateau over on the right-hand side. So that dotted line is a transconductance of the device, and it's how effectively it can amplify um, signals. And the fact that we have this very nice flat spot means that we have a device that can operate um, linearly across a wide range of gate voltages. And this is very important for a FET which aims to be a wide band um, device. So both this high uh, current density and this very um, nice flat plateau area and its transconductance makes slick a very interesting device for next-gen applications. 
you look at the middle plot on the right, or on the top, um, we're showing the drain voltage versus, um, the drain current versus gate voltage uh, on a log scale now instead of a linear scale. And in this plot, you can see that the turn on voltages under uh, 5 volts drain versus uh, a 0.1 volt drain, they turn off at about the same place. What this is, is a, a signature of very good electrostatic control, meaning the gate has very, very strong control over the channels. And this is very important for a very efficiently operating uh, mimic, and it also enables gate scaling, which thus enables high-frequency performance, which is important for, again, next-gen devices. And finally, on the right-hand side, you can see the output characteristics of our six-set device. And what you're looking for here is this very long region of very flat uh, characteristics where you can change the drain voltage across a wide range from 5 volts to 15 volts and see a very flat drain current characteristic. And this, again, is very important for high power efficiency, and it's an indicator that the gate has very good control over the channel because as you change the drain voltage, nothing is happening. Only the gate voltage affects the current running through the device. In Dream Phase 1, we focused on creating a device with very high power density, and uh, we were able to achieve 8.9 watts per millimeter. Now, this is a power density um, normalized by the layout area of the device, and this compares very favorably to what is commercially available um, at these uh, millimeter wave 30 gigahertz uh, frequencies. Um, and we were able to achieve 40% PAE at this output power, which is uh, important if you want to be able to increase your range because you're going to be power limited in, um, say, an example uh, platform. And the more efficient you are, the more power you'll be able to push out uh, of your radar. On the right-hand side plot is the linearity of our device. And we were able to demonstrate 10 dB OIP3 over PDC, which is our figure of merit for doing phase one for linearity. And what this allows you to do is push out a very wide range of um, signals um, without too much distortion. So moving on from dream phase one, in dream phase two, the focus shifted to creating devices with high frequency performance and this is what's needed to enable reconfigurable, adaptable systems. One thing that uh, SlickFed is very good at, it has been previously shown, um, one references IEDM 2014 paper, uh, SlickFed has been shown to have a superlative RF switch. And if we are able to show a uh, RF amplifier integrated with a superlative RF switch, it enables us to uh, explore mimic topologies such as um, reconfigurable matching and biasing and um, adaptive uh, uh, gate voltage biasing and drain voltage biasing, um, which allows you to have a mimic which is efficient under many different conditions, um, which is what you need if you're going to want a system overall that can uh, work well for multiple functions, not just one. So we have had a lot of success so far in Dream Phase 2. It is still in progress right now, but we have started scaling the device in all of its various geometries. We've shown, for example, in this middle plot, that as you thin the gate dielectric of the device, you can get better uh, Fmax performance, which is the figure of merit for frequency performance in power amplification. Uh, and we've also shown that as expected, as you as you decrease gate length of the device, uh, the FT and Fmax of the device both increase. So this is uh, very promising progress towards this ultimate vision of a very good RF amplifier with a very good RF switch, enabling these reconfigurable, uh, adaptable systems. In conclusion, success are a novel device topology which enhances the capabilities of GAN RF technology, allowing it to support the needs of next generation systems. Key attributes of this device are the stacked two DEGs, which enable high power density and power efficient operation for superior range, and a castellated channel and a gate, which enable high frequency operation for wideband reconfigurable systems.
Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Hayden McGinnis of Sandia National Laboratories. Hi, I'm Hayden McGinnis from Sandia National Laboratories, PI of the TikTok Project. The Global Positioning System, operated and maintained by the Department of Defense, consists of the constellation of 31 satellites and numerous ground stations. It provides an estimated worth of $70 billion annually to the U.S. economy alone. However, it is straightforward for even private individuals to jam incoming GPS signals in a local area, rendering GPS equipment inoperative. Even more worrisome, sophisticated entities, such as states or some terrorist organizations, can spoof GPS signals, leading to false location readings. No positioning method is foolproof, but one of the most promising GPS alternatives is inertial navigation, which requires a highly precise clock. The only known method of supporting GPS level position accuracy from an inertial navigation system for more than a few minutes is through continuously calibrating the onboard clock to an atomic frequency source, generally through probing the atoms with lasers or microwaves. The best clocks are optical atomic clocks. Unfortunately, these devices and support equipment usually take up an entire room, and even the physics packages, as seen in this photo, are roughly human size in each dimension. To allow for use in the field, it is necessary to drastically reduce the size, weight, and power of these clocks. With our DARPA AFI Optical Clock Project, we aim to replace bulky and fragile laboratory equipment with integrated photonic circuits, allowing on-chip optical routing, integrated single photon detection, and miniature vacuum technology, while still maintaining atomic clock level performance. Our project is named Trapped Iron Clock with Photonic Technologies on Chip, or TikTok for short. A conceptual prototype of the physics package, that is without support equipment, is shown to the left. To give you an idea of the size, here's the package compared to a one liter bottle. This work is a joint effort between groups at Sandia National Laboratories, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, Purdue University, Yale University, and OE Waves Incorporated. The heart of the system is a surface ion trap, an example of which is shown in the left corner. Surface ion traps are quasi two dimensional devices that can store and probe numerous ionized atoms. They are compact, usually only a few millimeters on the side, manufacturable with current semiconductor technology, repeatable and precise. In our case, trapped euterbium ions serve as the frequency reference for our clock. By probing the ions, we gain information about, and feedback to, the wavelength of our most precise laser, the so-called clock laser, which serves as our oscillator. Most importantly, our surface trap has built-in light delivery systems and integrated single photon detectors, significantly reducing the hardware needs. The high-power, low-noise clock laser is included on board, which mainly consists of a laser diode and a resonator that helps the laser to stay tuned to a precise wavelength. At its size, this will be the most precise laser in the world at this wavelength. Since a clock oscillator is a laser, which has a frequency of hundreds of terahertz, we need some way to electronically read this frequency out. Using two microfabricated rings in reference to the clock laser, these microcombs put out a beat note signal proportional to the clock laser frequency that can be easily measured by current technology. And tying the whole enterprise together is the multi-ensemble clock protocol. By probing the roughly 30 ions trapped in the device in a particular way, we can achieve a better than standard reduction in noise, allowing the system to hit the target stability metric. Here's some highlights of our progress so far. We've trapped multiple ions using only waveguide delivered light. This trap could support up to 24 ions and deliver five different wavelengths. The zoomed in section shows a trapped ion site with four different output gratings that shine laser light on the ion trap 50 microns above the surface. In another trap, we've shown quantum operations with a clock laser, proving this concept will allow for correct probing of the ions. We've demonstrated the world's first surface trap integrated single photon avalanche detector, operating at room temperature with an efficiency of 24% of the important ion wavelength, 369 nanometers. We first trapped the ion at the location indicated by the red circle and then shuttle it over near the SPAD for better detection. A prototype of the clock laser system has been built and tested, showing performance which will allow us to hit our stability metric. The onboard resonator helps narrow the wavelength of the laser by a factor of over 10,000. We've shown operation of the two micro rings leading to a beat note around, of around 20 gigahertz the final frequency output of our clock. These dual rings were made on a single wafer, which is unusual for this type of device and serves to reduce swap. 
So we've demonstrated most aspects of the important components of our clock system. We will now produce the final versions of each and integrate them into one package. Before I end, I want to mention this photonic integration technology is applicable beyond ion clocks. Photonic integration could have an important implication for quantum computing schemes that require light delivery and detection, namely ion and neutral atom-based computing. Most schemes use traditional macroscopic light delivery and detection equipment, which works well when they're on the order of 10 ions. It becomes increasingly difficult to see how the many ions likely needed for a general quantum computer can be supported by conventional hardware. A move towards compact and robust components such as those being developed by the A5 program may be crucial to realizing a practical quantum computer. And here are some of the people who are helping making this system a reality. Thanks for listening. This concludes our morning presentations. During the lunch break, please visit the exhibit halls to engage live with performers and visit the featured live demos on revolutionizing communications. The afternoon technical session will commence at 2.15 p.m.